Welcome to the State of Colorado's Watercraft Inspection and Decontamination course for experienced authorized agents. The purpose of this course is to provide standardized training that prepares staff to protect the waters of our great state from harmful aquatic invasive species. The mandatory boat inspection program in Colorado is operated with the cooperation of many different jurisdictions. While Colorado Parks and Wildlife, or CPW, coordinates the program throughout the state, Inspection sites are operated by city, county, state, federal, and private partnerships. Always striving for a seamless program across jurisdictions, CPW works with partners to maintain a standardized and consistent program. CPW has designed this standardized course that all inspectors in the state must take per regulation and pass to be certified to do inspections and decontaminations regardless of whom they work for. The state of Colorado has many years of experience operating the largest boat inspection network in the nation, and our protocols really do work. While the ANS program's priority is to prevent an introduction of zebra and quagga mussels into Colorado, the program is focused on all species that pose a potential threat to the state's waters. The majority of Colorado's lakes, reservoirs, and waterways have no invasive species, and we want to keep it that way. The state of Colorado has known populations of New Zealand mud snails, rusty crayfish, Eurasian water milfoil, and most recently, Brazilian elodea. The ANS program works to prevent the transportation and further distribution of these harmful invaders within the state. There are many species of ANS that are not known to be in Colorado, and we work together to prevent all these species from coming into Colorado. Zebra and quagga mussels, spiny and fishhook water fleas, African elodea, giant salvinia, hydrilla, parrot feather, and yellow floating heart. There is one major change in 2017, and that is that Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission has delisted or removed the invasive water flea, Daphnia lumholtzii, from the prohibited species list. This means that many waters that were formerly considered positive for Daphnia lumholtzii, or performing other ANS containment in prior years, are now reclassified as prevention waters for the 2017 season. Pueblo Hatchery has also been delisted for water flea and is now considered a negative hatchery. Let's move on to legal authority. After the discovery of zebra mussel larvae in Lake Pueblo in January 2008, the Colorado Legislature quickly passed Senate Bill 08226, also known as the ANS Act, in May of 2008. The ANS Act formalized the state ANS program. It made it illegal to possess, import, export, ship, transport, release, plant, place, or cause an ANS to be released in state waters. It provided the authority to agents and qualified peace officers to inspect and decontaminate watercraft for ANS. It also provides the authority for qualified peace officers to order a decontamination or impound a watercraft that is infested with ANS. It created in the state treasury an ANS fund in both the former Colorado Division of Wildlife and state parks. The allocation was severance tax at $4 million per year. We'll learn more about severance tax later in the slideshow. The Act created what is known as an authorized agent. This is the legal term for an inspector or a decontaminator. The law also gives authority to agents to temporarily stop and detain a conveyance and inspect for ANS, and to recommend and perform a decontamination if the operator is willing. You will be an authorized agent after you pass this course. Qualified peace officers are also known as post-certified peace officers. They can order the boat to comply and impound the boat if the boater is not compliant. Peace officers are only needed when the boater is non-compliant with an authorized agent's request for decontamination. It is rare that we need law enforcement support, but for those inspectors that have needed it, it is really great to have them to help. The Act also provides authority to Colorado Parks and Wildlife to create authorized locations. This is the location where a watercraft inspection and decontamination station takes place and is authorized by the state. This is where you will be working. In January 2017, Colorado Parks and Wildlife Commission passed new ANS regulations. Requirements were inserted into the Parks Chapter 8 ANS regulations which require the watercraft operator to clean, drain, and dry the watercraft and trailer in between each launch. The watercraft operator is now required to remove water drain plugs upon exiting the water body, 
and to remove all aquatic plants upon exiting the water body. It is now prohibited to transport a vessel or other floating device, which includes the watercraft and the trailer, over land with water drain plugs in place or aquatic plants attached. This is a large change to our regulations and we will need to educate all of our boaters about these new requirements this year. Also be aware that this includes CPW staff and professionals in other governmental agencies and in private industry. Anyone transporting a watercraft and trailer needs to pull the water drain plugs and remove aquatic plants prior to leaving the water body and are prohibited from transporting that conveyance over land with drain plugs in place and aquatic plants attached. The Commission also delisted Daphne Lemholtzii from Wildlife Chapter 0 Prohibited Aquatic Species Regulations and the Parks Chapter 8 Aquatic Nuisance Species Regulations. Okay, let's take a look at the state ANS program. First, we'll begin at the statewide level and examine the big picture. The mission of the Aquatic Nuisance Species Program is to protect wildlife, recreation, natural resources, water infrastructure, and the economy by preventing the introduction of zebra and quagga mussels and other invasive species through containing current infestations and stopping the spread into new waters. The ANS program achieves this through watercraft inspection and decontamination stations, sampling for early detection and monitoring of current populations, and public education and information campaigns. The ANS program's implementation is based on large amounts of data and scientific analyses. Everything we do is grounded in risk assessments based on scientific literature. In 2016, the ANS program updated several of their previous risk assessments. The main focus for watercraft inspection and decontamination stations, as well as sampling and monitoring protocols, is based on really three distinct analyses. The first being the risk of introduction. This is based on over a million watercraft inspection and decontamination data points. What is the likelihood that mussels will be introduced via watercraft? The data that you collect at your watercraft inspection decontamination station provides valuable insight to decision makers in terms of how to prioritize funding and resources. The second piece of the program is based on data collected by sampling and monitoring crews. This is focused on the habitat requirements for zebra and quagga mussels, and we call it the risk of establishment, also known as habitat suitability analyses. The first part is what is the likelihood that if introduced, mussels could build their shells and survive? The second part is what is the likelihood that if mussels built shells and survived, that they could grow, reproduce, and actually establish an invasive population? So let's talk about the risk of introduction first. There are five total factors that we look at from watercraft inspection and decontamination data. The total number of incoming inspections, the boater origin, or where is the boat coming from, the amount of boaters who answered yes to your risk assessment question, have you been boating out of state in the last 30 days, the watercraft risk level, which you remember from our watercraft 101, and whether or not the watercraft is coming from a Colorado positive or suspect water for any ANS. Again, we analyzed over 1 million data points from watercraft inspection and decontamination stations over the last several years. The scores were ranked for each category 1 through 4 and average to get the final results. It is very important that inspectors and decontaminators collect good, accurate data so that these analyses can be as complete as possible. The second phase, uh, which we call the risk of establishment, and many of you know is habitat suitability analyses, focuses on data collected by sampling and monitoring crews. This is 2013 to 2016 data in which 177 water bodies were assessed. We looked at over 280,000 statewide data points. The first part of this analysis is based on individual animal survival. We looked at calcium, pH, alkalinity, and hardness. These are the primary factors necessary for shell formation and give us information about whether or not a mussel can survive in a specific water body. The second part looks at long-term population expansion. We analyzed trophic variables including nitrogen, phosphorus, and chlorophyll A. 
This is the secondary factor necessary for long-term population survival. Our results were that all waters fall within a suitable range for zebra and quagga mussel habitat. Approximately 70% of the 177 lakes and reservoirs analyzed fall within the very high or high risk level. That means that they have optimal habitat for zebra and quagga mussels to grow and establish and become invasive. Over the last two years, our sampling and monitoring teams had temperature probes out in the lakes and reservoirs. We analyzed this data over the winter and determined temperature is not a limiting factor for zebra and quagga mussel establishment in any lake or reservoir in the state of Colorado. All waters fall within suitable temperature ranges for zebra and quagga mussel establishment and survivability. All of this data is extremely important to help inform decision makers. In the last year, the ANS Fund has changed. Due to a Supreme Court decision last spring related to severance tax, the ANS Fund is no longer collecting income from severance tax. CPW has used ANS Fund reserve dollars to complete the 2016 boating season. The Wildlife ANS Fund has no money left and is no longer collecting income. The expected fund balance beginning the 2017 calendar year in the Parks ANS Fund is approximately $1.5 million. CPW does not expect to gain any additional income from severance tax. We have undergone a broad stakeholder process the last nine months in order to raise funding for the 2017 season, which has been quite successful. We are also working with DNR to propose legislation that would provide a new stable source of funding for the ANS program moving forward. Just so you know how our funding is spent, 63% of the money that we have goes to fund our 11 very high risk waters. 12% funds our high risk waters, 17% medium risk waters, 3% low risk waters, and 5% very low risk waters. Again, the data collected at watercraft inspection decontamination stations and by our sampling and monitoring crews is providing valuable information and insights to our leadership team and our legislators in order to make decisions about how to spend our limited resources. Due to the elimination of severance tax as the ANS fund source, there are many changes that need to take place in 2017 to bridge the gap. The ANS program is taking a very large budget reduction in order to provide funding to watercraft inspection and decontamination stations and maintain critical functions at the program level. So you know what to expect in 2017. Education and information has greatly been eliminated. We will no longer be doing herbicide control on Eurasian water milfoil unless an alternate funding source can be identified. We will discontinue the rusty crayfish removal and monitoring program. We have also discontinued the New Zealand mudsdale monitoring program. We will continue to utilize our U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service QZAP grant to maintain our mobile app and data management system for watercraft inspection and decontamination stations. CPW will not be putting funding into this and we will survive solely on our grant this year. We will no longer have a decontamination specialist in the ANS program office to assist field sites with decontamination unit maintenance and repair. We will also not be doing secret shopper quality control. There will be no signs created with ANS funds this year, and we have zeroed out our research budget. We will maintain our sampling and monitoring program at greatly reduced rates, as well as the ANS laboratory. We are continuing to fundraise for sites, and we hope to raise enough money to be whole. It is likely that our very low risk waters and some of our low risk waters will not be funded for WID programs in 2017. We are working with our legislature very closely in order to support the program long term beginning in 2018. The Interim Water Resources Review Committee of the Colorado General Assembly has submitted Joint Resolution A, which is titled HJR 17-1004. This resolution is titled Concerning Funding for the Prevention of Aquatic Nuisance Species in Colorado. The main message here is that the General Assembly urges the United States Bureau of Reclamation, the United States Army Corps of Engineers, and the United States Forest Service to provide funding to Colorado Parks and Wildlife for the implementation of our state Colorado Zebra and Quagga Mussel Management Plan. 
Our legislature is urging our federal agencies and our congressional delegates to work together to provide funding on waters that they own or manage. Partners that support this legislation are encouraged to thank members of the committee for developing the resolution. They are also encouraged to contact state legislators and urge them to pass this resolution in 2017 session and to further work directly with federal agencies to secure legislative and or partnership-based solutions to fund the ANS program both in 2017 and for the long term. CPW has been working with DNR on a proposed ANS sticker or fee bill to fund the program. This is coupled with the agency's financial sustainability bill. What is being proposed is a potential ANS sticker for boaters, which includes motorized boaters and non-motorized boaters, as well as in-state and out-of-state boaters. There is also a discussion of potentially allocating $1 to ANS from fishing licenses should the financial sustainability bill get passed. We are open to many other ideas and are continuing to work with our partners and our legislators in order to find solutions that will fund the ANS program in whole for the future. Now let's discuss what the ANS program accomplishes and we'll start with sampling and monitoring. Sampling and monitoring crews monitor over 500 water bodies in the state. The crews follow standardized protocols that target specific life cycles of zebra and quagga mussels. We do plankton toes to find veligers, which is the initial microscopic planktonic baby life stage of a zebra and quagga mussels. The second life stage is called a settler. This is when mussels begin to settle out of the water column, building their shells. We put substrates in water bodies to try to identify the settler stage. The final life stage of the mussels are the adults, which is the two shelled animals that you're probably used to seeing. Sampling crews do shoreline surveys in order to identify adult mussels. You will learn a lot more about the mussel life cycle in the next module on biology. The crews also sample for crayfish plants and other mollusks. Due to our budget restrictions, in 2017 our sampling and monitoring crews will focus solely on zebra and quagga mussels and will do minimal work on crayfish plants and other mollusks. We will also not do native species inventory work. You will see our sampling and monitoring crews throughout the year. The frequency and quantity at which we sample is based on the risk of the water body and has been reduced for 2017. We appreciate your help to get these CPW staffers on the water fast so they can get their work done most efficiently. On this slide, you see a graph that summarizes our monitoring activities by year. As you can see, we focus monitoring on plankton toes to try to find the microscopic villagers that live in the water column at the earliest possible phase of introduction. We also spend a considerable amount of time doing water quality monitoring to establish the likelihood of invasion should occur. That's the risk assessment we've already discussed. We sample for ANS using different methods for different life stages. Similarly, we have different standards to positively identify zebra or quagga mussels depending on the life stage, or to verify a detection of ANS. For villagers, or the microscopic larval life stage of mussels, these are free-floating in the water column and are not visible to the naked eye. These organisms must first be identified under a microscope. We need to see an animal. Then we use PCR or polymerase chain reaction to confirm the species identification using molecular analyses or DNA analyses. Lastly, gene sequencing is used to ensure the DNA of the species in question genetically matches zebra or quagga mussels completely. In order to list a water body positive for villagers, we have to see the animal and get positive results on two rounds of genetic analyses to confirm that there is no other animal in the world it could be. For the settler and adult life stages of mussels, taxonomic identification must be confirmed by two independent experts. DNA analyses may or may not be required to confirm the taxonomic identification. The same is true of plants, mollusks, and crustaceans. In August 2013, the Western states gathered in Denver and agreed on regional language and water body definitions for ANS detections. Colorado adopted this language in January 2014 along with the other Western states. 
There have never been an adult detected in Colorado water bodies to date. We have only found zebra or quagga mussel villagers or DNA in Colorado. All waters are now negative for zebra and quagga mussels in Colorado and therefore must operate as prevention waters. Some waters may be positive for a different ANS, such as Eurasian water milfoil or New Zealand mud snails. These waters follow the other ANS containment procedures for boats exiting the lakes. An inconclusive means that there's an exposure to mussels, but the actual organisms have not been found. This typically occurs when environmental DNA is found. There are no inconclusive waters in Colorado for mussels. A suspect water means that a body of water has met the minimum criteria for detection only once. There are no suspect waters in Colorado for zebra or quagga mussels. A positive water body means that the water body has met the minimum criteria for detection more than once. There are no positive waters for zebra and quagga mussels in Colorado. An infested water body means that there is an adult reproducing population in the water body. There has never been an infested water body in Colorado. That said, please know that we are surrounded by infested waters and they continue to pop up throughout the season. Kansas, Nebraska, South Dakota, Montana, Utah, Texas, Oklahoma, Arizona, California, Nevada, and everything east of Colorado has an infested water body. We must be on high alert for both in-state and out-of-state watercraft that are coming from out of state. In addition to adopting the listing standards and the minimum criteria for detection, Colorado also adopted the Western Regional Panel's Building Consensus Standard for delisting waters for zebra and quagga mussels. This went into effect in January 2014. Per this regional standard, a water which has tested positive for zebra or quagga mussel villagers or eDNA must go through five subsequent years of negative testing to be delisted from a positive to negative status. This is pretty big news for us in Colorado. This year, in January 2017, Colorado delisted Pueblo Reservoir after five years of negative testing. This makes Colorado the first state in the nation to go from positive to negative for zebra and quagga mussels. Remember, back in 2014, Colorado delisted Grand Lake, Granby Reservoir, Shadow Mountain Reservoir, Willow Creek Reservoir, Jumbo Reservoir, and Terriol Reservoir after five years of negative testing. All of these reservoirs had a single villager detection in 2008 with no detection since. Blue Mesa Reservoir was also delisted in 2014. Only eDNA has ever been found in Blue Mesa Reservoir. There has never been a villager or an adult detected in Blue Mesa. Colorado has successfully stopped the continued inoculation of our waters with zebra and quagga mussels through the implementation of our mandatory boat inspection and decontamination program. The work that you perform on the boat ramps every single day really does work and is critical to protecting our water bodies from invasion. So let's talk about Watercraft Inspection and Decontamination, or the WID program. Colorado is a mandatory inspection state. This means that a boat has to be inspected before launching in any water of the state according to state law. If the watercraft has previously been launched out of state, if it is leaving an ANS positive water within the state or prior to launching anywhere the owner or manager requires it. The majority of our WIDs are prevention based. All out of state boats must pass a state certified inspection prior to launching on any Colorado water body. There are four types of watercraft inspection and decontamination stations. A negative prevention water is a water that has never had any verified detection of ANS. This includes those that were delisted and do not have another ANS present. The other ANS positive water bodies are those that have had a verified presence of an ANS listed in Chapter 8 Parks Regulations other than zebra and quagga mussels. These are typically Eurasian water milfoil or New Zealand mud snails. All ANS positive waters are also prevention waters for zebra and quagga mussels and other species of aquatic nuisance species. There are no zebra and quagga mussel containment waters in the state of Colorado as of January 2017. 
These would be waters that have had a verified zebra quagga mussel detection and have not met the timeline for delisting. An off-water WID is an authorized location that is not based at a lake or reservoir. These are typically offices or are marine dealers and industry locations. There are just over 70 WID stations in Colorado operated by a variety of jurisdictions. We do expect this number to decrease in 2017 due to our budget restrictions. A majority of these are operated by CPW and private industry. This is a statewide partnership effort. CPW does not own very much water in Colorado, while we are one of the largest recreational managers. This map shows the distribution of inspection stations across the state. As you can see, it is our goal to have stations corner to corner. In Colorado, a boater should never be too far from an inspection station to comply with the mandatory inspection regulations. There are many partners involved, including private industry, federal government, local governments, and of course, state government. Colorado leads the nation in the number of boat inspections performed annually. As you can see, the inspection numbers come to about 400,000 per year, including entrance and exit inspections. In total, the state has collectively performed 3.5 million inspections and 62,000 decontaminations since we began in 2008. Decontaminations continue to increase year after year. It is important to note that there was a large increase in the number of decontaminations performed in 2016. This is a direct result of CPW and our partners adapting to mitigate new threats. Research publications indicate zebra and quagga mussel villagers can survive up to 27 days in standing water on watercraft. Another factor increasing Colorado's need for decontamination is the increase in mussel-infested waters in other states, including Lake Powell, Eastern Arizona reservoirs, and Northern Texas reservoirs. Lastly, waters in close proximity to or positive for another ANS, such as New Zealand mud snails or Eurasian water milfoil, perform more decontaminations to limit those species spread in the state. CPW and their partners revised mandatory standing water decontamination triggers in 2013 to reduce the threat of invasion from viable zebra or quagga mussel villagers living in standing water to protect against watercraft coming from other states infested waters and to reduce the spread of other invasive species within Colorado. Now let's talk about the infested mussel boat interceptions. Unfortunately, mussel boat interceptions are also on the rise. There have been 119 mussel boat interceptions since the program began, including one in 2017 so far. All of these boats were coming in from out of states and were fully decontaminated before being allowed to launch. Pueblo has by far the most interceptions with 38, and Blue Mesa and Horsetooth are tied for second with 14. Those are three of the busiest reservoirs in Colorado. But it's not just the heavy lifters that get the mussel boats. We have had interceptions in all four regions at very large and very small reservoirs operated by all jurisdictions. And the mussel boats are coming from all directions. We have intercepted boats from all across the country. The reason 14 are unknown is because those boats were in so many infested waters traveling across the country that we couldn't pin down where the mussels came from. Colorado is truly surrounded by infested waters and we have the tools to prevent those infested boats from getting into our waters and we can keep our waters clean and free of invasion if we follow the standard WID protocols. Let's talk for just a second about Lake Powell. The invasion at Lake Powell is a new threat that is growing faster than ever. This is a statewide problem. We have seen mussel boats intercepted from Lake Powell at North Sterling, Highline, and Navajo. Lake Powell is only one infested reservoir that we have to worry about. Since we started, many states have turned up positive while we have gone negative. We are surrounded by mussel infested waters, but our protocols work. Let's move on from WID and talk about other aspects of the ANS program. Quality assurance is required in regulation that the ANS program conducts quality control evaluations to ensure that stations are following standardized protocols and providing adequate protection to those lakes and reservoirs. This has included in the past secret shoppers, on-the-job training, 
Evaluation of Customer Service Representatives. The intention of quality assurance is to help field stations. The intent is to improve inspections and decontaminations and ultimately provide the highest protection of our resources and recreational opportunities. Inspectors must score a 70% or better to pass a QA evaluation. The evaluations are based on the inspection procedures that we will cover later in the inspection module. One big change this year due to budget restrictions is that the ANS program will not be performing secret shopper evaluations. Managers are required to perform at least one evaluation using the standardized form on every ANS staff members annually. Contractors are required to do this monthly. Please remember if you are a supervisor or a contractor to send your forms to the ANS program. This is valuable data that we provide to our leadership team in terms of decision making. We also use this data to improve our training program and improve our protocols. Moving on to the state fish hatchery units. Hatcheries in Colorado are required to do annual fish health inspections. They have protocols in place specific to their facilities and fish transport to prevent the spread of fish disease and invasive species. They are regularly monitored for ANS and to date, no zebra quagga mussels have ever been found in a Colorado hatchery. Protections are in place so that CPW has the highest assurance of risk mitigation just in case. CPW always tries to set the example and maintain the highest standard to do the maximum protection of our resources possible. Again, you will see ANS sampling crews and aquatic biologists from time to time at reservoirs or on the inspection ramps. Every member of our crews is certified to do their own inspections and decontaminations. They fully decontaminate all their equipment and boats in between each and every use. They will be green sealed with a receipt. You will see the protocol in the inspection module under the green seal section. While they do have to stop it to have the inspectors verify their seal and receipt, we ask that you do not hold them up on the ramps. They are being paid with limited ANS funds, same as you, to sample and monitor the lake and reservoir, and we need to use those resources as efficiently as possible to get them on the water fast so they can get their job done. It is a waste of state resources to have them sitting in line waiting to launch their boat after we just paid them to decontaminate it. We greatly appreciate inspectors quickly moving them through the lines and getting them onto the water as fast as possible. All Western states and Canadian provinces have ANS programs now. Some have very sophisticated boat inspection systems similar to Colorado. However, many states are unfunded or underfunded and all lack the personnel needed to run inspection stations. While there are many challenges ahead for other states and for the region, the Western states are working together to find common solutions and create a system of reciprocity between the Western states and provinces. We are connected and we are helping each other. Let's move on to education. Education is the most important thing. As an inspector, your primary objective is to educate boaters and anglers to clean and dry their boats and gear in between every single use. Now it is required in regulation that all watercraft operators clean, drain, and dry in between uses, remove all plants, and pull water drain plugs. Colorado will never have the resources to perform inspections and decontaminations on every water body 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Research has shown that using the authority of the resource or making one understand their impacts on the environment is the most successful way to change negative behavior. If boaters and anglers understand that transporting ANS will cause harm to their favorite boating and fishing spots, they are more likely to clean, drain, and dry their boats and gear and transport them over land, clean, drain, and dry every day. The state of Colorado ANS program trains about 700 inspectors per year. Inspectors go out on boat ramps and through the inspection and decontamination process, you train close to 90,000 registered boaters not including our out-of-state visitors, through the performance of over 400,000 inspections per year. In doing so, you are teaching the boaters to clean, drain, and dry. You are teaching the boaters not to transport standing water. We are changing the culture of boating. If there is no water, no mud, no plants, and no animals, 
together we are significantly reducing the risk of transporting invasive species. To assist you with educating the public, we have many educational materials for you to use. The program office develops these to meet the needs of the field. This year alone, we have four new handouts available for your use. We have an ANS program fact sheet, a muscle boat interception fact sheet, a risk assessment fact sheet, and an economic impacts fact sheet. Using these materials provided by the program office helps all jurisdictions maintain consistent messaging to our public every day. You have completed Module 1. Thank you for your time. You may now proceed to Module 2.